Okay, welcome everyone to this week's Welcome Change, a showcase series where we will hear from the world's leading social entrepreneurs about what's working and what's next. My name is Mark Carr and I am with the Shoka Changemakers and I am so delighted and excited to welcome Tim Lampkin, who is joining us from Clarksdale, Mississippi. Before we get into what Tim is working on, let me add that we'll have about 30 minutes together today and, we'll, and we hope to get to some of your questions toward the end. So feel free and please drop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen as we go along. So let's get started. Uh, Tim, I would like to turn it over to you um, to introduce yourself and share any opening reflections that you may have. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, before I get started, I want to just take a brief moment and honor uh, one of my grandfathers that passed away this Sunday. Um, his name was John Columbus Brown. Uh, he was a true advocate for the work that we do here at Higher Purpose Co. So I would just ask that everyone that's watching, wherever you are in the world, uh, think about somebody that has inspired you, that has supported you uh, in your journey of creating change and um, really honor them um, in this moment. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, I'm really sort of kudos to you for taking this moment to recognize those of us who have come before and who have paved the way for us. I'm, I'm sure he's very proud of you. Um, and, you know, I just want to take a moment to let that sit. Okay, now, before we get into the meat of our conversation, would you like just to take a brief moment to introduce you um, and just briefly state, state your organization's name and then I'm going to sort of tee up the conversation so that we can tease out more from your very impactful story. Absolutely, Mark. So my name is Tim Lampkin. As everybody knows by now, watching across the world, I have the pleasure of living uh, in Mississippi. Um, we are uh, really excited about the work that we're doing here at Higher Purpose Co. Um, but I think what's important is to actually understand the place of uh, Mississippi. Uh, I actually live in what's called the Mississippi Delta, uh, which is about uh, 18 counties here in Northwest Mississippi. So flatlands um, really um, were kind of the birthplace of the cotton industry, uh, but also thinking about the, the cultural uh, aspects of this area. Uh, from the music to the food to the civil rights um, history that uh, surrounds us every single day. And this fertile soil that I have the pleasure of walking on every single day uh, has birthed uh, so many great um, uh, musicians and artists and creators um, from all around, that people know from all around the world. And so um, this place is special. Um, and I'm sure that everybody uh, has a unique DNA to their community. And uh, I'm really grateful to do this particular work in this place. And so uh, here at Higher Purpose Co., uh, we've had the, the honor of really serving our community. Uh, we really led with uh, the fact that in 2016, uh, we wanted to organize ourselves uh, as community members um, to really come up with solutions. Um, and we oftentimes uh, call ourselves solutionaries. And for us, uh, it's really about leaning into um, not just talking about the problem, but how do we get to a solution that fixes uh, what we're seeing on a, on a everyday basis. And so we work with over 200 uh, Black entrepreneurs, farmers, and artists, and really supporting their growth um, in, in business development, uh, really focusing on business ownership, uh, because we believe ownership is really key to really addressing uh, some of the systemic issues as it relates to the racial wealth gap uh, here uh, in our state. And so we do business education, we do business funding and business, fun um, business advising, um, but we really are building this uh, amazing community. And we always talk about the community of us first, and that's the team, that's our board of directors and our partners. And then we elevate our community internally and then we uh, project um, those resources and that community and that, that that conversations around supporting each other um, to that external uh, community that we're building all across the state of Mississippi. Thank you so much, Tim. And I, I just want to piggyback off your introduction about Mississippi. 
Um, I'm originally from Missouri. I'm from St. Louis originally, uh, but I very much consider myself a son of Mississippi. Uh, my ancestors were enslaved there. Uh, my father was born there. All of my grandparents were born there. I went to school there, I went to Ole Miss. Um, and I think Mississippi does not get the credit um, that it that is due um, in regards to how the state and the people of that state have been instrumental in changing unjust systems in this country. Um, and not only do I think about the music, the blues, the food, the crawfish, speaking of the food, but I also think about people like Fannie Lou Hamer and Margaret Evers and the countless others who really labor, and sometimes giving their lives um, to create change. And so I think there, you know, even when I was going to school there, there was such a robust ecosystem of change makers and people who were really working and fighting for justice. And so this leads me to my first question to you. Can you speak a little bit more about how your organization, Higher Purpose, is feeding that ecosystem of system change? What exactly are you guys working on? What excites you about what you're working on that you think could truly create deep impact for the people of your state and for the people of this nation? Absolutely, Mark. I think, you know, there are so many different parts of our work that um, we've, we didn't know at the time when we were building this that we would be the first. So, you know, we've launched the first business fellowship program for black entrepreneurs, farmers, and artists. Uh, we've launched the first statewide membership for, uh, you know, businesses, uh, black businesses here in the state. Um, but I believe what we've been able to do that's been more um, on the side of uh, innovation is around our funding network. Um, and not necessarily the funding network as, it, you know, in terms of the components of it, but more so about how we are reimagining and really challenging this conversation around collateral, right? Collateral um, being reimagined, uh, particularly in a place that has um, so uh, so much mixed bag of history around, um, you know, slavery and institutionalized racism. And so, you know, you're asking Black people, particularly, and, you know, and that's the group that we work with, to bring collateral to uh, the, the bank, uh, to actually borrow money, right? And we know that some particular uh, financial institutions and even um, uh, individuals um, that identify as, as white here in our state um, were born into wealth, right? The, the extraction of wealth uh, and the labor um, uh, of Black people uh, here in the state has built uh, wealth. And then you turn around and ask us um, to provide co collateral to borrow money from the wealth that we created, right? And so we've been really challenging um, ourselves as well as, you know, these systems, particularly the financial system, to really reimagine um, what does collateral look like, but also how do you create um, a, a system where there is different types of capital working together uh, to benefit ultimately Black you know, black people here in the state to build viable businesses. And we know that um, what we're doing is very unique in a way that is challenging people to uh, rethink and reimagine. But it's also, uh, Mark, it's also helping us really look at power and how power uh, needs to shift uh, in our state. And that gets us into a conversation around policy and other dynamics. But for us, it's really how do we challenge the status quo? Right? How do we lean into those moments and those conversations that are uncomfortable? And I feel like um, for years and decades that, you know, the conversation has always been the same when it comes to having collateral to borrow money to start a business. Um, and now, you know, I won't be naive to think there are not programs that are flexible uh, that exist uh, across our country, but, you know, this is an issue that's happening in our state. And so while this is um, very unique to Mississippi, I know that other places have, you know, tackled uh, this issue in, in various different ways, but that doesn't mean that what we're doing is um, not needed uh, in our state because we are trying to and sometimes catch up and get ahead of other, you know, states and places that are doing um, unique things around, you know, business development and collateral. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tim. 
And before I get into the second question, my second and final question for you, um, I want to let the audience know, um, just in case you missed the beginning of this conversation, this is Welcome Change. I have the pleasure of interviewing Tim Lampkin. My name is Mark Carr. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Now, Tim, I, what, what I heard from, what I took away from what you just said is what you're working on is a deep and profound uh, shift, not only uh, working on that shift within the financial system, but using that shift to also redis redistribute power. Um, that's powerful, right? Um, and I loved how you said that, you know, we have been sort of, we were wealth, literally African-Americans were, were wealth in the state of Mississippi. And now we're being asked to provide collateral after we've already created wealth uh, to borrow money to try to, uh, for less of a better, for lack of a better term, catch up, right? Um, now that really makes sense on a sort of theoretical, technical, like, you know, level. Can you speak a little bit more about how, you know, your work is impacting individuals? Can you share any stories of um, how, how your work is really bringing about transformation for individuals and, you know, what that looks like on a very sort of personal level? Yeah, that's a great question, Mark. I think, you know, there's several different stories I could share, but I would kind of keep it very um, general to sharing how we've been able to leverage um, our funding network that has this kind of a, we call it almost like a continuum of capital, right? There's a, you know, in the financial world, you hear often about the capital stack and how different types of financial products are leveraged to really, you know, get the overall capital that's needed to get a business off the ground or a venture off the ground. And so we do that in real time um, with all of our um, entrepreneurs that come through the funding network. So we have um, we have business growth grants, we have individual development accounts, we are a Kiva hub, we are the only Kiva hub in the state of Mississippi where we leverage zero interest loans that don't require collateral um, to, you know, help those uh, businesses get uh, started and grow. And then we bring in our other uh, CDFI partners, which are community development financial institutions, and leverage their capital. And then we get into some of the traditional banks and then equity investments and loans guarantees. Um, particularly, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the loan guarantee, how we've been able to leverage that and couple that with other um, financial products and services. So we had a, a couple that uh, was looking to, you know, expand their business uh, in Greenville, Mississippi, uh, and they had been kind of, you know, growing their fruit arrangement business for a very long time. And so they got into our fellowship program, they completed the fellowship program, we provide all of our fellows some, some capital in that program. They won the pitch competition for the fellowship program. So they had about $4,000 of grants coming out of that. Uh, then we worked with them through our funding network to connect them to one of our funding network partners, uh, got them approved for a $40,000 loan, um, and then we leveraged our loan guarantee to reduce the interest rate, reduce closing costs to actually set it up where they didn't have to pay the first three payments, um, that that was actually going into a savings account for them. Uh, and now um, they're, they've purchased this building, they've, they've taken a building that was vacant for about two and a half years on Main Street in their community, bought it, revitalizing it, and now they they have this asset that they're building. Um, and so, and the other parts of this, they're creating a very healthy, conscious business um, that is going to be able to reduce some of the um, health disparities here in our state by providing fresh fruit and juice and things like that. And so, you know, that is, um, that's just one story, Mark, uh, that, you know, I'm really excited to share. And they're having their grand opening in a few weeks. And so uh, we will be showing up to um, support them. And so that's just a way that we've been able to like leverage the different types of capital. You got the grants, you got the loan, you got the loan guarantee. And then ultimately what we're doing, we're able to reduce the risk, not just for the financial institution, because that's oftentimes you're going to hear the financial institution does not want to take the risk Right. And so by us basically vetting these entrepreneurs, having a support system for those entrepreneurs and then leveraging these different types of capital, uh, we're able to reduce the, the risk for everybody involved, not just what's going to benefit the financial institution. Because at the end of the day, we really are advocating for our entrepreneurs. And that's why we're not 
um, position as our positioning ourselves as a financial institution um, because we want to make sure that we are really playing that role as an advocate and a support and we're able to you know let the financial institutions do what they do and then we come in and do what we do best um, to support the entrepreneurs um, along the way. Great, great. Thank you so much, Tim. And we know that that type of giving um, early stage entrepreneurs, giving them some runway is very important to, their, to the success of their businesses. Um, great work, man. Um, just so that we can ground folks, I'm not sure when people were able to enter the conversation. But my name is Mark Carr of Ashoka Changemakers. We have a gem on our talk today, um, the gem in the persona of Tim Lampkin of Higher Purpose based in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Um, we are gonna open up the conversation in Q&A. Um, so if you all have questions, please, it is not too late to put them in the chat box. And I see we have a few more questions, a few questions that have come in. Um, so let's get right to it. Um, question from Anonymous. Tim, could you say more about how you're redefining collateral? Could you provide maybe some additional examples to that? Absolutely. So when we say redefining collateral, what we try to do in most cases is that we remo remove um, traditional collateral from the conversation. So in some cases, people will say, uh, you know, I have a house, I have a car, right? I have personal assets um, that if this loan of my business didn't work out, hey, financial institution, you can have these, right? In most cases, we do not even allow that to be a conversation. Uh, what we like to do is focus on other uh, collateral uh, aspects. And so that could be equipment, that could be the building that they're purchasing. But we want to make sure that we're trying our best to remove uh, personal collateral, things that will hinder a person from living uh, their life, right? We don't want somebody's home uh, to be uh, leveraged for or, uh, you know, to start a business. And, you know, that is kind of, that's a, that's a practice in most cases uh, right now. And I can't speak for, uh, you know, other places across the, the state and, and all, uh, across the world, but, you know, that is a practice. And so trying our best to remove personal collateral from the conversation is one way that we, we look at uh, kind of redefining collateral. The other part that I talked about is also uh, reducing closing costs. A lot of people think like, oh, okay, I have a, you know, 8%, you know, loan and, you know, I have these flexible kind of repayment terms, but then when you look at closing costs, right, how much, how much is being added on to that loan that you're not even thinking about, right, that, oh, I'm, I have $3,000 in closing costs, right, and so that makes the loan more expensive uh, for the, you know, the entrepreneur, um, so that is, you know, a couple of ways that we are looking at redefining collateral, and also how we're thinking about closing costs, like, if, if there's a way that closing costs can be removed from a loan, we want to do our best to, you know, make that happen. And then the other thing uh, that I mentioned other, uh, earlier is around um, basically leveraging the loan guarantee to buy down the interest rate, right? So we could come in with a loan guarantee and say, hey, I know the interest rate is 7%. Let's leverage the loan guarantee. Can we get that down to 5%, right? Because at the end of the day, we're reducing the risk for everybody involved, and particularly the financial institution. If something happens to that, that, that loan or that business, we're guaranteeing between 60 to 75% of the total loan value uh, that could be repaid to the financial institution in case something happened. Thank you so much for that, Tim. And I'm looking at the questions here. And it seems like there's a bit of a, a threat that I'm seeing, at least with a few questions, of people really excited about your work and wanting to understand how your work can be applied on a much broader scale. Um, so we have a question. I want to actually merge two questions that are very similar. We have a question from Michael and Elena um, that has to do with what can mainstream financial institutions learn or apply from your work um, uh, to close the racial wealth gap? And um, what, what does the public sector need to do to contribute to those efforts? 
Okay, I think I got it. Okay, two two great questions. So in terms of mainstream financial institutions, what they can learn, I think one of the things that we found is that a lot of the financial institutions that we are working with have great, great products um, in terms of lending. What was missing, in, and this is my opinion, just looking at the work, was there was no conversation with the actual potential borrower. So mm -hmm. you are creating a loan product because you want to dive into supporting more Black-owned businesses, but had, have you talked to Black-owned businesses in your area? Have you asked them what they really needed? Have you really done, not just hired someone to come in and assess the area, but your lenders going into the community, calling people up on the phone, holding virtual meetings with Black-owned businesses and saying, what do you need to move your business forward? We are a financial institution. Uh, we want to support your business. We want to create a product that, you know, can help your business move forward. That, that's what I saw was missing before the pandemic. And then we know that, you know, when the pandemic hit and all of the racial, um, you know, horrific events that happened around our country and the, and the world, uh, a lot of people were leaning more into supporting Black-owned businesses, but were not actually checking in uh, with those, you know, the, you know, the main target audience. And so I think mainstream uh, financial institutions can really learn from us how to do the work at a community level. Right. And just because you have a branch in a community does not mean you have a community connection. And I know some people don't want to hear that, but that is the truth. You have to be rooted in community where you can literally pick up the phone and call people and they'll show up in five minutes. Right. Hey, I need your help with this. Hey, we're trying to figure this out to really move the community forward. That is, you know, what I feel like is missing. And, you know, we've had, you know, several historic events that have happened and we're seeing now a lot of financial institutions are going back to this kind of community banking model um, where they're looking at not just the financial um, aspect of the individual but they're looking at the character and the perseverance and the creativity to really consider um, you know making a decision on you know providing that capital um, the second question mark I feel like I forgot it but, <laughs> but uh, what was what was the second part of that question um, I yeah I think you actually answered it all the question was what can um, financial institutions learn um, I guess it's sort of we talked about financial institutions but we also want to talk about the public sector other That's sector, it. absolutely. Yeah, so programs like ours and organizations, I think, you know, uh, would benefit from, you know, the public sector um, really looking at their spending and to really assess what amount or percentage of your budget is going towards, you know, uh, supporting particularly black, uh, black owned businesses and black and brown businesses, I think is really important. And this is for us, this is not something that needs to be just something that's trendy. Right. We're calling uh, folks to say this needs to be a long term commitment. Right. Because the the issues and all of the uh, challenges and barriers existed before 2020. And so we are really trying to make sure that people are reimagining um, how they're really committing um, to this work. And so looking at budgets, I think the other way that people can be supported is to look at where they're spending their dollars with vendors, um, being able to reassess how much money are you able to reallocate to black and brown businesses and indigenous businesses um, that really support um, lo the local economy. The other thing is, you know, entrepreneurship um, is really uh, appealing right now. I believe that we have to really shift some of the conversations around entrepreneurship to business ownership, right? Because if you do not own something in this country or any other place, um, you are already um, at a disadvantage because owning something gives you something to build upon, right? And having that asset. And so I think being very clear about um, supporting business ownership, not just the activity and excitement around entrepreneurship, but actually being a business owner where that particular individual um, is not 
working in the business every single, single day, that they're actually managing a team and they have the, the livelihood and the freedom to do other things in their lives. Because if they just go from working, you know, 80 hours a week for someone else to working 120 hours for themselves um, and pouring into that business and not having the infrastructure and the sustainability to really grow that business, then that's also going to put um, them into a you know, particular bad shape. And so we want to really encourage um, business ownership and really make it a thing, make it something exciting in your community, in your area, uh, where folks are really um, you know, pouring into it and investing in it on a, on a regular basis, not just in a, you know, a temporary basis. Thank you so much, Tim. And I can gather from the questions that folks are really eager to tap into the deep well of knowledge that you have about the community that you serve. So Simon asks, um, well, starts with the more of it was well, a question. Your network includes black entrepreneurs, farmers, and artists. What experiences are amongst these groups that are similar and what challenges or opportunities in 2021 are unique to these different groups? Great question. So we work with over 200 members uh, in our organization. Majority of them identify as Black women, uh, single, uh, single parents, uh, first-time uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, majority of them come to us seeking between zero to uh, ten thousand dollars of capital um, to really start or expand their business. Um, particularly with our farmers, our farmers are um, a little bit more up in age um, because of the. Uh, I would say because of the stigma around working um, on land um, that happens here in Mississippi, particularly associated with cotton industry and slavery, uh, there's a huge, uh, you know, kind of dynamic where majority of our farmers are, um, you know, over 45 and, you know, they have, you know, between 10 to 100 acres of land that they're cultivating. Um, our artists um, identify um, in various different ways, very creative and making handmade things as well as uh, visual artists, photographers, um, dancers, creative directors. Uh, and so they bring a different level of uh, energy uh, to our membership, which we are always excited uh, to, to engage with them. I think some of the challenges um, I would like to kind of frame them as opportunities, Mark, if that's okay, because I really don't like to talk about the challenges in that way. I think the opportunities, um, particularly when we look at uh, access to um, rural um, broadband and internet access is still a huge uh, challenge, but also an opportunity. And we know there are some resources happening uh, and coming, coming down the pipeline. I think the other opportunity um, is to really um, leverage this membership that we're building to really have a, a significant impact when it comes to policy and informing policy uh, on a state level as well as a federal level. And then I think the other kind of uh, opportunity that we have is to help um, our state um, really recreate itself um, and in that narrative change that I often talk about and really reframing how people think about Mississippi and how people in particularly Mark I wanted to say how people think about black people that live in Mississippi um, mm -hmm. that you know that we are not all um, living uh, in impoverished conditions that we are amazing that we are creative, that we are building businesses, that we are running organizations and leading and doctors and lawyers, right? How do we tell more of those stories um, in mainstream media and still, you know, wrestle with some of those challenges, but not uh, playing into that negative narrative all the time and really talking about the innovation and creativity and the change that's happening every single day in communities all across um, our state. Uh, and so I think that's also um, really important for us to you know, think about as we move forward in our work. Amen to that, bro. Now we are just at um, time and I wanna be respectful of people's time. Definitely wanna be respectful of your time. Would you be willing to answer at least one more question before we close out? I'm, I'm excited to answer as many questions that we can. So I okay. see a lot of them. Uh, I wanna be able to get to some that I know we have a limited amount of time, but yes, let's take a few more questions if possible. Okay, absolutely. And let's continue on, you know, how you're building this community effort and how the community is supporting yourself. Um, and so 
Um, along that, along those lines, we have a question from Ann Evans, um, which is, do businesses, do the businesses you support, do they get involved in the work of other organizations uh, within the higher purpose network? Um, for example, do they become mentors? Um, do they pay it forward to helping support other businesses? Um, can you speak a little bit to that? Absolutely. And I don't know when this particular individual joined, but the business I was talking about earlier uh, that's opening up in a few weeks, we actually paired them uh, with another business in our network to provide that mentorship. So we call it a uh, member mentorship. And so where we are connecting members within our network uh, that have a level of expertise to share that knowledge. Uh, we also do monthly membership meetings. We actually had one last night where our members get on. We have a guest speaker. Uh, where we provide that area to, to network. Um, the other ways that they support each other is just posting about each other on social media, you know, clapping for each other, you know, really supporting each other and, and actually purchasing products from each other, uh, which we believe is another area of opportunity for us to really dive into is how do we really kind of create um, this system where uh, businesses are buying from each other and that kind of gets us a little bit into kind of cooperative economics in some ways. And so that is one of the ways uh, that those businesses are supporting each other within the community. I think the other piece is really important here, Mark, is a lot of our entrepreneurs are also engaged in other organizations. So they serve, you know, on local school boards and chamber of commerce and other organizations that are really connected to community. And they're bringing this energy of, you know, let's do it together to those areas as well and talking about the work that Higher Purpose is doing and how Higher Purpose is supporting them. Thank you so much, Tim. And there were um, a lot of questions here for you. You're a popular um, guy. Um, I think some of the questions maybe we can follow up with offline. So I'm gonna close it out with a question that sort of wraps a nice big red bow around this conversation. And that question is from Anonymous. And it is, what do you hope will be different in 10 years as a result of your work and the work of your um, community? Wow, that's a, uh, that's a big question. <laughs> you know, I hope that, I'll say it this way, I really hope that the work that we're doing is not needed 10 years from now. And I say that in a way because we saw that this was a huge void in our community because no one else was doing it. And we want to make sure that we get it, this work to a place with our community that we're building where, honestly, there's no need for us to do this anymore because the systems that we are working on, they would have been revamped and reimagined and shifted in a, in a place and in a way where um, it's no longer needed to have a conversation about making access to capital for everybody, right? That capital will be available, affordable capital will be available for everybody, that the conversation around collateral will be completely different, uh, that uh, businesses will be open and ran um, here locally um, by the majority of the population, uh, particularly here in the Delta um, that you know identifies as, as Black. I think the other thing is that when we look at household income um, and really looking at the disparities around the racial wealth gap, that that would have been shifted and that you would see this, this uptick in um, really creating you know, that, that idea of, uh, of wealth where individuals are able to you know, continue to buy land, to buy home, to invest in their children's education and to reinvest back into that, their community. And we're doing that um, and every single day um, here. And we know that the work that we're doing um, is just, just the beginning of a, a long-term change. And, you know, part of, part of what we're doing as well, Mark, is, you know, we're building um, a community a hub here in, in Clarksdale. And the idea around that is to really show people what's possible um, when we work together and really unite around a particular place uh, that can help folks have a destination, have, help people have a, a hub and a home uh, that really um, elevates and creates um, the resources that are needed to really shift um, you know, their lives. And so I am 
just really honored to to serve and be in this position where uh, I get the chance to wake up and do something every single day that I absolutely love and to you know be of service um, to so many people across our state um, that uh, believe that there's a better future for them and that they are seeking um, to be you know the best version of themselves and leaning more into you know having that sense of of ownership in a way that allows them to, you know, reach their full potential, uh, whatever that might be for them. Thank you so much, Tim. Really appreciate you, appreciate your work. Um, love the energy, like I'm excited just talking to you. And I'm sure there are folks in our audience that are like really eager to help out, to get involved, to learn more. So can you wrap us up with just a few words on how people can support you or any sort of calls of actions you may have? Absolutely, Mark. I just really want to say thanks to everybody that tuned in. I see a few people that I actually know, a few of our supporters and uh, contributors and donors. It's always great uh, to, you know, to see everybody. You could definitely learn more about our work at higherpurposeco.org. That's higherpurposeco.org. You can learn about um, all of our programs, um, the community hub that I mentioned, some of the recent events and upcoming events that we have going on. And then you know, learn about the team that I have. I have the pleasure of working with uh, eight amazing Black women every single day. And so um, there's a lot of lessons I can share around supporting Black women uh, in this space as well. And so you can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter at Higher Purpose Co. And it's Higher Purpose CEO. And connect with us, share what you've learned, um, you know, from this talk, as well as other ways that you know, we can stay connected. I would love to, you know, answer more questions, but we're out of time. And I hope that this is not the, you know, the last time I'll be able to connect with, you know, the global community because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I'm always eager to, to learn and, you know, uh, apply things um, to our area and also share because we're getting a lot of requests um, from other states, other areas, um, to replicate our work or partner with us. And we're always open to that. And I don't know if we could pop in my email address, but I'll just say it. It's, it my email address is Tim at higherpurposeco.org, T-I-M at higherpurposeco.org. Shoot me an email if you want to stay connected or if I didn't get a chance to answer your question on today. Tim, this has been a great conversation. I know I have new insights and perspectives that I would carry forward uh, with me, and I'm sure our audience does as well. For everyone who joined, look out for a link to today's conversation in the follow-up email, and we'll be posting an interview with Tim on Forbes next week. So please stay tuned for that. Now, finally, we have a great conversation coming up on a range of timely topics from young people and mental health in the pandemic, indigenous food systems, to the, to the future of food and the right to sign a conversation about deaf, change makers, and early language access. So have a good rest of your day. Be on the lookout for future opportunities to connect with the leading um, uh, change makers through this, these conversations um, and see you all soon. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you again. Thank you.